The following Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Mike Riddle and is entitled Noah's Ark, Fact or Fiction? For a free catalog of all of our tapes and books, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. See how many people come back after I was so mean on the evolution of Well, I titled this The Genesis Flood. The subtitle is an approach based on logic and scientific laws. What I'm not going to do in here is probably use a lot of geology. Because using logic and the laws of science, we can show there had to be a worldwide flood. So our topics. I'm going to start with, does God exist? See, when you're talking to evolutionists, they don't believe God exists. They don't allow for supernatural. So does God exist? Then... After we establish that, we're going to take a look. Is he an omnipotent, omniscient being? I use those words because it makes me look real good. <laughs> All-powerful, all-knowing. Then we have to look at, is a worldwide flood even possible? Is it even Because if it's not possible, the argument's over. There had to be a local flood then. Then what does the Bible teach about the flood? And how about number five? Are long ages necessary for what we observe? Isn't that an interesting way to put it? Are long ages necessary for what we observe? Then finally, is there any evidence of a worldwide flood? So those would be the six questions we answer in here. And we'll start here. The importance of the flood. First of all, we have to see, is it an important issue of the flood? Because if it's not important, we don't need to talk about it. Well, let's take a no flood or local flood scenario. A no flood or local flood scenario is what is adopted by evolutionists. They do not believe in a worldwide flood. They might accept a local flood. It is also part of the theistic evolution movement. Those people who believe in a day-age theory, those people who believe in the gap theory, those people that believe in something called progressive creationism, all believe in a local flood, not a worldwide flood. So they're believing in billions of years of death and destruction before sin. If you're believing in billions of years, you are believing death before sin. However, if there was a worldwide flood, then evolution and all forms of theistic evolution must be false. Why is all that? Why is this so important? Well, see the fossil record. The evolutionists and theistic evolutionists. How do they get their billions of years' time in there? Well, they do it based on the fossil record. But see, if the fossil record, what they do is they use things called index fossils. For instance, like a trilobite, supposed to be 500 million years old. So if you found a, a trilobite fossil, it's about, the sediments are about 500 million years old. If you find a T-Rex fossil, it means the sediments you found are about 80 million years old. So what the evolutionists do is they use these index fossils to index into the strata to determine the many different ages of Earth's history. And that's basically what the theistic evolutionists are buying into also. Millions and millions of years of Earth history. But if there was a worldwide flood, when would most all those creatures have been buried? At about the same time. That means all these different creatures point to one time period in Earth history, not many different geologic ages. So if there was a worldwide flood, evolution and theistic evolution must be false. In other words, you cannot have a worldwide flood and an old Earth. The two will not go together. So we have to maybe clear up our thinking on that one. It is not even logical to think that. So the flood is very important. If there was a worldwide flood, the earth is young. No worldwide flood, the earth can be billions of years old because that's how we get the fossils. So it is very important under discussion of creation evolution. So question one now. On our way to discussing, is the flood really a worldwide flood? We'll start with God, does God exist? You know, there's only two possibilities here. Either in the beginning God created or in the beginning nothing created. Now which one is more logical right there? So right there we have the, the advantage of being logical. But let's look at this. I'm going to use some laws of science here. Now, here's some ideas. Theorems, models, hypotheses, theories, assumptions, dogma, speculation. Those are all originated and formulated by mankind. We originate and formulate theories. We originate and formulate hypotheses and assumptions. So we do all that. Notice, originate and formulate. But above that, we're going to find a very large gap in our scientific model. Very large gap. It's called scientific laws. We discover scientific laws through observation. 
We formulate ideas about scientific laws, but we do not originate them. Where did our scientific laws come from? That's a good question. See, we can originate, formulate theorems, theories, assumptions. We can originate, or we can formulate ideas about scientific laws, but we do not originate them. They have to come from somewhere. Let's take a look at a couple of these. The first and second laws of thermodynamics. What do they teach? Well, both of these laws combined teach this. The universe could not have created itself. That's from the laws of science. They also teach the universe had to have a beginning. And matter cannot be eternal. Both these laws teach that. So the question then is, where did this universe come from? Oh, the Big Bang. No, 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 you can't use that, folks. You can't have something go bang until you have something that can go bang. So where did that original matter come from to create this universe? See, based on the laws of science, somebody had to be there to create it or put it there. The universe simply cannot create itself. The origin of matter. Joseph Silk, Ph.D. astronomy, wrote a book called The Big Bang. Now, this man is an evolutionist, firmly believes in evolution, says this. It is only fair to say that we still have a theory without a beginning. I like statements like that. <laughs> then we have this one. Stan Aldwell worked at NASA, wrote a book called The Astronomy Cafe. Astronomers have not the slightest evidence for the supposed quantum production of the universe out of a primordial nothingness. Wow, isn't that good news? Now, can, can, I want to take a, a, just a, a quick step here. Can I give you an upper-level quantum physics, physics course here for just a moment? This is, this is an upper-level quantum physics course. So if I go too fast or I get too technical, stop me and I'll repeat myself for how, how this happens. This is almost exactly what they teach. This is how that matter got here. Now, this is quantum physics, so it's going to be technical. There was nothing there. Then there was something. Did I go too fast for anybody? And you know what we call that? We call it a quantum fluctuation. That is a scientific name for magic. <laughs> well, John Hartnett, PhD, he's a physicist and cosmologist. This man is a creationist. He wrote a book called Dismantling the Big Bang, brand new book. If you want to understand anything about the Big Bang, this is the book we need to have, his book. And he says this, Universe is, by definition, the planets, stars, and galaxies that surround us. Insofar as the Big Bang Theory does not explain the origin of these objects, then we can say Big Bang Theory does not even address the question of the origin of the universe. It does not even get to first base. This man is a physicist and a cosmologist. He understands the issue. That's the book you want to get. He writes in such a fashion that he makes it understandable. He will show definitively that the Big Bang was scientifically dead over 20 years ago. The only thing that keeps our Big Bang theory alive or Big Bang hypothesis alive is the education system because they don't know any better. They're too busy reading their textbooks. But you know the Bible has answers. Now, I'm not slamming teachers. I want to make sure I'm not slamming teachers here. But I am going after textbooks. Why? They deserve it. The Bible has answers. The evolutionists have absolutely no answer for where the matter came from. You know, the Bible teaches, in the beginning God created. All things were made by him, John 1, 3, right out of the gospel. Colossians 1, 16, for by him were all things created. In other words, we have an answer, don't we? We know where that matter came from. It's by faith we believe. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so things were seen were not made out of things which appear. We accept it by faith. We are commanded to have faith, Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith it is impossible to believe God. You see, we have faith, but we have a reasonable faith because at least we have an answer. Evolutionists have no answer because they don't allow for faith. They don't allow for supernatural. Therefore, we can conclude this. There must be a creator God because there's no science anywhere that can support how matter got here. Somebody or something had to create it. That means by all laws of science, there has to be a creator God. Now, who's being scientific? The creationist, not the evolutionist. Well, let's go a step further. Who is this creator? Is he omnipotent and omniscient? Is he all-powerful and all-knowing? Well, let me set you up here. 
Dr. Werner Gitt, one of the leading information scientists in the world, wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information, makes this statement. There is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. Now, what, what information is he talking about? We have something in us called DNA, don't we? That has information in it. Let's take a look at these gentlemen. Lane Lester, PhD in genetics, and Ray Bullman, PhD in molecular cell biology, write this. DNA is an information code. The overwhelming conclusion is that information does not and cannot arise spontaneously by mechanism, mechanistic processes. Then they continue. Intelligence is a necessity in the origin of any information code, including the genetic code, no matter how much time is given. In other words, information does not arise by spontaneous chance events. It doesn't matter if you had a trillion years, it still won't happen. Now, we take a look at that DNA code. And then we look at our computers and we say, oh, how great we are. We even created these CPU chips down there that contain billions of circuits on them. We've created hard drives that contain gigabits of capacity there. And we pride ourselves in what we can do. Then we look at DNA, which is millions of times more compact than anything we have created. And it contains an information code. Where did that information code come from? That is millions of times more compact than anything we have created. Based on that, since we did not create the DNA, it's always been here since life has started. And it's millions of times more compact than anything mankind can do, we can conclude the originator of the DNA code must be vastly more intelligent than mankind. <laughs> Hope nobody's attributing that vastly more intelligent than mankind to random chance, because you know where that puts us then. <laughs> Let's take a look at another scientific law. The law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect basically teaches that for every effect there must be an equal to or greater than cause. In other words, the universe requires an initial cause. Something had to cause it to start. Something cannot create itself, and nothing can create something. That's based on the laws of science. Therefore, let me tell you, show you again these laws of science. The universe could not create itself, nothing can't create something. Let's go back to the laws here. Beginning of the universe, beginning of time, Based on the second law of thermodynamics, this universe has been wearing down. The second law basically teaches this. Energy goes from a state of usable energy to a state of less usable energy for doing work in an isolated system. In other words, over time, everything's losing its available energy. Everything is wearing down. That is exactly what we see in this entire universe. Everything over time is wearing down. Well, why don't we take that backwards for just a moment? So the universe is greatly worn down from all the time it's been here. But if we were to go back in time, based on the second law of thermodynamics, we would have a universe with much more energy in it. More energy than is in the entire universe today existed back at the beginning of time. Therefore, we can conclude, since the universe in the past had more energy than it does today, we conclude the originator of the universe may be extremely powerful because they created all that energy. Because matter cannot create itself. The universe could not create itself. The universe had to have a beginning. Somebody had to create it. Whoever created that vast amount of energy, and we know it had more energy than the entire universe has today, they had to be very powerful to make all that energy. You know what the Bible teaches? All Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. We have a creator, folks, that is all-powerful. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. We have a God that is all-knowing because he was able to create all those little pieces inside of us, all those billions of pieces inside our cells, and make them all work together in the right order. We have an all-knowing God. He knows everything about biology. He knows everything about anthropology. He knows everything about astronomy. We have an all-knowing God. You know he knows everything all about physics, too. We have an all-powerful, all-knowing. Therefore, the creator of the universe must be omnipotent and omniscient. You see, the laws of science support 
There must be a creator God, and he is all-powerful and all-knowing. And you know what else? Because that which may be known of God manifest in them. Which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly, un being, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in Godhead, so they are without excuse. Folks, there is no excuse for not believing in a greater God that is all-powerful and all-knowing. There is absolutely no excuse. That means every evolutionist has willfully rejected a greater God. So we know God must exist. Based on the laws of science, God does exist. Based on the laws of science, he's all-powerful and all-knowing. But now we have to ask the question, is a worldwide flood even possible? We do have to ask that question. Is it possible? So let's look at that part of this talk. I want to start with the original flood. It's called the Martian flood. Let's start there. Here are pictures I got off the web. Ancient Mars water world imagined. There's the Martian oceans. Has anybody been to Mars? No, we haven't been to Mars yet. We've got some things that have landed up there. So, and here's some statements. As the magma swelled upward, it drove water out of the basin nearly the size of the United States. Epic floods resulted according to the research. That's called the Martian flood. An epic flood, basically of biblical proportions, happened on Mars. Here's another one, 2004. Evidence that suggests Mars was once a water-rich world is mounting as scientists scrutinize data from the Mars Explorer rover. Floods of biblical proportions on Mars. I have a question of logic here. How much liquid water has been found on Mars? None. Now let's bring that down to its logical conclusion here. The Earth, three-fourths of the Earth is covered with water over seven miles deep. Do evolution believe a worldwide flood occurred on Earth? No. You get the logic here. <laughs> Something is missing here. Some of these neurons are just not connecting up here. No water has been found on Mars, but yet above the flood of biblical portions. We're 70 cent water, we won't believe a biblical flood here. Why not? Why won't they believe this? I call this our box example. Our box example. And we need to understand this to understand how many evolutionists think. It's very important to understand how to be a better witness. The evolutionists, we got this box here. And we're going to say is all ideas in the universe are inside this box. These ideas can be right or wrong, but all ideas in the entire universe are inside this box. Anything outside this box is not right or wrong. It is unthinkable. And guess what the evolutionists put outside that box? God's Word. That's why it cannot even be considered as an option, regardless of the scientific evidence. You see now, when it comes to many evolutionists, scientific evidence does not matter. All that matters is we think in their worldview called evolutionism. They have a commitment to what is called materialism. All that exists in this universe is mass and energy. There is no supernatural. They have ruled out a savior, Jesus Christ, right there. But is a worldwide flood possible? Well, without mountains or sea basins, we straightened out the whole earth. We could cover the earth with about 1.7 miles of water. So if the earth was flat, we'd have enough water to cover this earth to about 1.7 miles deep. What about Mount Everest, which is 5.5 miles deep, though? Well, gee, there, there goes your worldwide flood. It can't cover Mount Everest now, can it? And many other mountains. Well, we need to think about this logically. Mountains formed near the end of the flood. Tremendous tectonic movements. You know, we find the uppermost parts of Mount Everest contain, guess what? Fossil-bearing water deposit layers. What does that mean when we find seashells on the top of Mount Everest? Let's use some logic here. Now, one thing I'll let you know before we come to a conclusion here. These seashells did not have legs. You know what that means? They did not walk up there. So how did they get up there? The only logical conclusion is Mount Everest and all the mountains in the world at one time or another had to be covered with ocean water. See, during that flood, we have tremendous tectonic movements. Volcanism going all over this planet. Plates pushing together, causing rapid mountain uplifting. It does not take long ages. 
we find seashells, marine fossils, on top of just about every mountain range on this planet, which is firm evidence they all had to be covered with ocean water at some time, just as the Bible teaches. So worldwide flood is possible to have covered the entire Earth, the mountains to at least 15 cubits. But where did the water go, Mike, if it covered the whole Earth? Well, let's take a look at Psalm 104 for maybe a, a possible suggestion here. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you found for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over. They may not return to cover the earth. The valleys sank. The mountains rose. God put the water in a place that would never again flood the world. It's called the ocean. See, the Bible has answers. We have answers for the hope that's in us. See, we can be 1 Peter 3.15 Christians. We can have those ready answers. So, God does exist. He is all-powerful and all-knowing. A worldwide flood is possible. It is actually physically possible. Now, what does the Bible teach about the flood? Is it a local flood or is it a global flood? Well, here's a Dr. U. Ross. He's got his Ph.D. in astronomy. He's one of the leaders of the, what we call the progressive creationist movement. Now, the progressive creationist movement is a rather large movement in this country. It is a belief system that says the Big Bang is what caused this universe to start. It is a belief in the Big Bang cosmology. It is a belief that stars formed by natural processes, God did not have to create them. It is a belief in billions and billions of years of Earth history. It is a belief in death before sin. It is a belief in a local flood. It is a belief in a subrace of humans before Adam and Eve. And that is supposed to be the biblical interpretation, according to progressive creationists. Let's see what they have to say. Genesis 8 gives us the most significant evidence for a universal with respect to man and his animals and lands, but not global flood. Notice, anybody notice what I call a weasel word there? Universal. A lot of his followers believe that he believes in a worldwide flood because he calls it a universal flood. No, he doesn't. He calls it a universal flood, but then turns around and says it is a, not a global flood. Here's what he goes on to say. What does the geologic data tell us about massive floods in the Earth's history? The evidence shows that the only place in the world where massive flooding has occurred since the advent of modern man is the region of Mesopotamia. We are not saddled with the contradiction between established facts of science and the words of the Bible. Do you see this man's worldview right here? He is starting with man's wisdom over God's word. Notice the established facts of science over God's word. That, folks, is the progressive creationist movement in a nutshell. The worldview they have starts with man's wisdom and puts that above God's word. In other words, we've lost our fear of God. We have more fear of man than we have of God. You want to find out how to take care of that? This is your book. This book discusses every argument the progressive creationists use and shows how, number one, they're not being biblical, and number two, they've used incorrect science. Make sure you get this book. Here's what's happened, Colossians 2.8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man and not according to Christ. We've been warned, folks. Our starting point should always be God's word, not man's wisdom. We need to get our fear of God back and understand who God is. Let's take a look at this local flood scenario. This is the biblical flood according to progressive creationist and day age theorist. That is the flood right there. That's interesting. Let's take a look at that. Genesis 7. Let's see what the Bible really teaches. Genesis 7, verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. Verse 22. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. Are we seeing a pattern to these words here? All, every, whole. What does that mean? All, every hole. Nowhere does it say Mesopotamia. Nowhere does it say local region. It says all. Then in verse 23, 
and every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth and Noah only remained alive and they were with him in the ark. Folks, if God would have wanted us to understand this was a worldwide flood, could he have made it any clearer than this? God's word clearly teaches a worldwide flood. And then we can use more logic, study. You know, in the Bible, there are over 10 words, Hebrew and Greek, that can be used to stand for flood. Only two of these words are ever used to describe the Genesis flood. Malbul in the Hebrew and cataclysmos in the Greek. Both these words basically mean the same thing, a large cataclysmic inundation. Every other word in the Greek and the Hebrew that talk about a flood mean a small stream flood, such as the Nile overflowing its banks. Only these two words are ever used to describe the Genesis flood. What that means is that Genesis flood was different than any other flood that ever occurred. Because God makes a very big distinction with his word usage here. Then critical thinking. Could a local regional flood destroy all people, beasts, and birds of the earth? Could a local regional flood do that? Well, let's look at this. The flood occurred about 1,600 years after creation. About 1,600 years after creation. Now let's go back. When Israel entered Egypt, about 70 people entered Egypt. 430 years later, we read this. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. In other words, after 430 years, we went from 70 people to over 600,000 men. That doesn't include women and children. So we may have gone from 70 people to about 2 million or more in just 430 years. What does that mean? It means about the time of the flood, folks, there could have been easily over 500 million people living on this planet. Think of a local flood destroying them all. Could a local regional flood have destroyed 500 million people, all the land animals, and all the birds? It's not even logical to think that. It's a distortion of God's word. More critical thinking. Noah had over 100 years to build that ark. We know how long he really took, but he had over 100 years to build that ark. Why, if this was only a local flood, didn't he just go over the mountains to another land and be safe there? Why did he have to spend over 100 years building an ark? See, it doesn't make any logical sense. God brought the animals and birds to the ark. Why did God bring two of every land-breathing creature, including the birds to the ark, when they would have been safe where they were at? Don't you think after 1,600 years, some birds would have flown out of the Mesopotamia area? See, the whole theistic evolution idea does not make any biblical sense. We need to get back to starting with God's word as our first source, not man's wisdom. Then I like to use a little logic here, gravity, water and gravity. If I were to take a glass of water here and pour that water onto a table, what happens when that water hits the table? It hits that table and begins to spread out and will continue to spread out until something stops it. Now, why doesn't that water stay there in a nice little pile when I pour it out? Well, one of the answers is called gravity. See, gravity exerts a force in that water, so it causes it to spread and spread until something stops it. But let's go back to the description of a flood now, the worldwide flood. Forty days and forty nights, the floodgates of heaven are coming down. The springs of the deep are bursting forth. And the waters cover the highest hills by at least 15 cubits, about 22 feet. And gravity is exerting a force in that water, causing it to spread and spread until something stops it. But guess what? There's nothing there to stop it because the Bible clearly teaches the waters cover the highest hills, the highest mountains. That means this cannot be a local flood unless you don't believe in gravity. You see, if anybody does not believe in gravity here today, you come forth when I'm all done and I'll use you as a test case. <laughs> you see, science will always support God's word because who created the science? God did. He's not in a battle with himself, folks. Science will always support God's word. It's just man's wisdom gets in the way sometimes. This could not be a local flood unless you're believing this. <laughs> that is a description of the day age theory and progressive creationism right there. The Bible clearly teaches the waters covered the highest hills, the mountains, by 15 cubits. Water will not do that. Let's see what the New Testament. You know the New Testament confirms the Old Testament here? 
out of Matthew and Luke, confirmation from Jesus about the historical fact of the flood, Noah and the ark. Out of Hebrews, chapter 11, confirmation of the flood, Noah and the ark. So the writer of Hebrews confirms it. Second Peter, only eight people survived the flood. The New Testament confirms the flood. So it's not just an Old Testament story. But you know, we can go outside the Bible and support what we're saying here. We can go outside the Bible. You know, there's many historical records out there that confirm what the Bible teaches. Archaeology. You know, over 33 separate tablets have been discovered of a gigantic flood. Over 33 different tablets. Of these tablets, 30 mention an ark. 28 mention an ark that came to rest on a mountain. 29 state that birds were sent out. 30 mention favor for the survivors. And most of them mention an act of worship as the survivor left the ark. There's external evidence. Then we have the Well Blundell Prism, found in 1923 in Lower Mesopotamia, written about 100 years before Abraham. The record begins with eight kings who ruled before the flood. And at the end of the list of kings, it says that a flood swept over the earth. Wow. External evidence there of a large flood. The record parallels the genealogies given in Genesis chapter 5 and 11. Long lifespans are mentioned that parallel what we find in the Bible. There's external evidence from the Well Blundell Prism. Then we have the Ebla tablets. Up through 1974, over 17,000 clay tablets were found in northern Syria. Written on clay tablets around 2400 B.C. Contained a creation account and a flood account. The tablets also mention Sodom and Gomorrah, which are often by the secular community thought to be a myth. But yet there they are in archaeological records. The most popular epic we have of a flood other than the Bible is the Epic of Gilgamesh. But nobody stops to analyze this. The Epic of Gilgamesh simply would not work. Why? There's some problems. They have a cube for their boat. What would happen if you were a cube in the water? You're going to have a lot of rattling of brains going on in there, a lot of mixing of animals. That thing is just going to roll and roll and roll. It doesn't work. Besides, they only had a few days of rain versus 40 days and 40 nights. Now, think about 40 days and 40 nights of floodgates of heaven. We, were, we heard things like Katrina, a flood of biblical proportions. No, it's not, folks. Katrina did not even come close to the Bible. How many days did it rain down there? A little over a day, maybe two days. What happened? Devastation. We're talking 40 days and 40 nights, the floodgates of heaven. And we're talking much of the water coming from the springs of the deep. Katrina was not even close to the biblical description. All it takes is 24 hours, and we can have devastating floods. Think of 40 days and 40 nights then. Then we take a look at our ark. Now, which, which one does the Bible describe as the ark here? It's not hard. Then the question I have is, why? Do we continue in our churches to put A in there? You know what we're teaching our children? The Bible's a myth. Because that's what the world is teaching. The world is teaching the ark was a houseboat with drab heads sticking out. But you know, most all churches I go into, what do they have? They're teaching our children the Bible was, the ark was a houseboat with drab heads sticking out. We are teaching our children to believe like the world. We need to get back to the real description. That ark was large, about one and a half football fields in size. That was a large, large vessel. Oh, but how could he fit all the animals? There are millions of species out there. We couldn't fit them alone, folks. That's thinking like the world. Let's think like scientists. You see, there's not millions and millions of kinds out there. Let's think biblically. Let's put on our worldview glasses from the Bible, not the world. How many dogs, canine, had to go on there? Two. How many of the chicken family? Two. How many of the cat family? Two. How many dinosaurs? Maybe only about 50 different kinds. Oh, but they're too big to get on there, Mike. The biggest dinosaur egg we ever found was only about the size of a football field, folks. Where in the Bible does it teach that God bought the great big grandma and grandpa dinosaurs to the ark? See, we've been trained to think that way. All God had to do was bring the young juvenile dinosaurs, the young juvenile giraffes, the young juvenile hippopotamus. Because if he brought the great big grandpa and grandma dinosaurs and animals to the ark, they wouldn't be able to reproduce that well when they got off. See, we need to think biblically and not like the world. And you start thinking biblically, you're going to be thinking good science too. The flood. Paul Benware, professor, 
of biblical studies says this. The fact that the flood lasted for more than a year, something not true of local floods, indicate that Noah's flood engulfed the whole earth. Has anybody ever seen a local flood last for a whole year? Doesn't do that. Only a worldwide flood would. So the summary of the evidence here. The Bible teaches the flood was a worldwide flood. External evidence supports a worldwide flood. What does that mean? All forms of theistic evolution and evolution have to be false. The evidence clearly supports there was a worldwide flood. Now, since Genesis flood was a true worldwide flood, why haven't we found that ark? Well, I've got good news. We have. We have found the ark. Haven't you seen it in the press? Do you see what non-biblical thinking does? It distorts your whole view of real science, and you start thinking about anything. Well, question it. Since the Bible clearly teaches a worldwide flood, why do so many churches and church leaders not accept the biblical teaching? Notice I said there, I'm not talking about evolution. I'm talking about churches and church leaders now. Why do they not accept a worldwide flood? It's because we serve a new God in our churches today. It's called man's wisdom. We are now bowing down to man's wisdom over God's word. That is the description of the day-age theory, progressive creationists, and the gap theory. Read the Bible, not the commentary. That is the inspired word of God. The commentary is not. The Bible tells us out of James 4.4, friendship with the world is enmity with God. That word enmity means hostility, hatred. If you're believing like the world, you're at war with God. If you're believing in evolutionism, you're at war with God. So God does exist. He is all-powerful, all-knowing. A worldwide flood is possible. And the Bible clearly teaches a worldwide flood. But now we have to ask ourselves, are long ages necessary for what we see out there? So standard belief. Standard belief is geologic time scale, millions of years. Fossil record, billions of years. Formation of large canyons takes millions of years. Fossil fuels take millions of years. That's the standard belief. But you know that belief is wrong. Mount St. Helens showed us that belief is wrong. Because out of Mount St. Helens, where do we get large canyons formed in one day? Oh, wait a minute, Mike. How do you know those canyons were formed in one day? Very easy. One day they were not there, and the next day they were. <laughs> Boy, isn't God great? A sedimentation. We're normally taught that thin layers of sedimentation take thousands of millions of years. Guess we have at Mount St. Helens. Enough sedimentation to simulate 10,000 years that were formed in one day. Wasn't that a wonderful gift? It was a tragedy, but it was also a wonderful gift of learning good science. How about right here, close by, Walla Walla, Washington. There's a canyon, 500 meters long, 40 meters deep. It was created in six days. That's six literal days. I don't know what progressive creations would be, but that's six literal days. Fossil fuels, we have coal. You know we can make coal in one week now? It does not require long ages. We can make coal, very good coal, in one week. We can make oil. Today we can make oil, simulating natural processes in one day. It's not going to solve any potential energy crisis because it takes a lot of energy to do this. But the fact is, long ages are not required. We can even do petrified wood in one week. We can turn wood into petrified wood one week. So where's this whole idea of long ages coming from? Not the Bible, not science. It only comes from a philosophy called evolutionism. Carbon-14, I'm not going to go into a whole discussion of this. We have, it, uh, we have the 40-minute version out there on a DVD. Carbon-14, radioactive isotope. You all have carbon-14 in you, so what does that make you? <laughs> Turn the lights out and we'll watch a lot of glowing going on. <laughs> Do you know carbon-14 is also an unstable isotope? It's unstable. You know what I just said there? Carbon 14 is unstable. You all have carbon 14 in you. What does that make you? Yes. Now you know why. Now it has a half life about 5,730 years. So after about 10 half lives, after about 60,000 years, 60, 70,000 years, all the carbon 14 should have decayed out of, an, of a specimen. In other words, carbon-14 can only be used to really date organic material, once living things. But after about 10 half-lives, 60, 70,000 years, all the datable carbon-14 should have decayed out. If we find any carbon-14 in these specimens, that means they cannot be older than 60, 70,000 years old. Well, how old is coal? It's supposed to be millions of years. Guess what we find in every sample of coal and oil? Carbon-14. What does that mean? 
that coal cannot be old, neither can that oil. That's all in that book, too. Thousands, not billions. Guess what we're finding in diamonds that are supposed to be millions of years old? Carbon 14 still in it. Enough to date it. Those diamonds, even the ones you have in your rings, too, are not millions of years old. I'm sorry. Go ask for a discount. <laughs> stalactites, we're told, take many, many years to, rep to create. But you know, we've watched stalactites grow one inch a year for 10 years. It doesn't require long periods of time. Clock and rock. There's a fossilized clock and rock. That was not there a million years ago. Here's a fossil ship bell, fossilized. Here's Abraham's spark plug for his chariot, fossilized right there. <laughs> and there's his hat. <laughs> Folks, fossilization does not take long periods of time. It's the right ingredients, the right circumstances. So are long age necessary? No, they're not. They're not necessary. So let's come down to the last part. Is there any scientific evidence for a worldwide flood? We've shown that God does exist. We've shown that he's all-powerful, all-knowing. We've shown a worldwide flood is possible. The Bible does teach a worldwide flood. Long ages are not necessary. But is there any scientific evidence to support what we're teaching? Well, let's look at this. Are long ages necessary? No. Are only long, slow processes consistent with what we observe? Absolutely not. Even the evolutionists know that we've had many catastrophes throughout the history of this earth. Therefore, based on logical thinking, there has been many local catastrophic events in Earth's history, or maybe there's been one worldwide catastrophic event and maybe some other smaller ones. Those are the only two options we have. Those are the only two options. Many local catastrophes, or maybe one worldwide one and some local one. You can no longer hold to long, slow processes only. So what do we observe? Billions of dead things buried in sediments all over the world. What do we observe? Fossil graveyards all over the world. Thousands of creatures all buried together. Dinosaur graveyards. Marine fossils on top of mountains worldwide. Large amounts of biomass buried for fossil fuels, coal and oil worldwide. Evidence of turbidites. Turbidites, underwater landslides. More than 50% of the world's sedimentation was laid down by turbidites, underwater landslides. You know, we've actually observed these underwater landslides to lay down 100,000 square miles of sediments in a matter of hours. That's been observed. What else we observe? Lack of time breaks between rock layers. You know, in the Grand Canyon, there's about a half a billion years of time missing there, sedimentation missing. Who took it? <laughs> Preservation of animal tracks worldwide. Polystrate fossils, those are tree fossils in coal beds worldwide. All of those are worldwide occurrences, folks. The only way we know that could happen is the logical conclusion, the evidence supports there's a creator God, there was a worldwide flood. Both the Bible and the scientific evidence clearly supports that. What does this mean then? It means evolution is a myth, invented in Genesis 3.15. What? I didn't see the word evolution in there. It's right there, folks. You just need to read it. It's called, and ye shall be as gods. You rule out a creator God who becomes God, small g, we do. That is the foundation for evolution thinking right there. And it was popularized by Charles Darwin and the education system. Second, many churches have been captured by the wisdom of the world. Colossians 2.8, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Again, Colossians 2.8, beware lest anyone cheat you through a philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men and not according to Christ. Folks, we need to get back to having Christ-centered thinking. He is our creator. He is our savior, not man. He will be our judge. So what does it mean? We need to be Acts 1711 Christians, folks. We need to check these things out. We need to be like good Bereans. Check it out. We need to be 1 Peter 3.15 Christians. We need to have a ready answer for the hope that's in us. But do this with gentleness and respect. And we need to bring down strongholds and anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10. Four and five. Those are commands. And finally, what does it mean? We have hope through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, John 3, 16. That's what it ultimately means right there, folks. That's what evangelism is all about. Bringing down strongholds, having a ready answer, and bringing people to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. We need to be 1 Peter 3, 15 Christians. We have to have that answer. That means we need to study. God bless all of you.
This has been Noah's Ark, Fact or Fiction, presented by Mike Riddle. To receive a free catalog of all of our Bible teaching books and tapes, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach, call 800-977-2177 24 hours a day or on the web 